We're so happy to have Sheldon Reynolds from Members Trust Company joining us this evening to talk about these turbulent markets that we've all experienced over the past couple months. First, I want to say a few things about Members Trust Company. Members Trust Company is um, a trust company that works solely with credit unions, and they provide trust services for our coastal members and other credit unions around the country. Most people don't really understand what trust services are, so I thought I'd give you a personal example. My personal estate planning names a Members Trust Company as the trustee of a trust that uh, if my wife and I were to pass away, would be left for my daughter. We did not want to put the investment responsibility onto the people that were asking to also raise our child. So we have named Members Trust Company as the trustee who would take care of the investing portion of that and be responsible for executing the details of our trust. Other examples would be special needs trusts and even some other types of uh, irrevocable trust like charitable remainder trust. With that, I'm going to now introduce Sheldon Reynolds. He is a chartered financial analyst, lives here in Raleigh. Uh, he's been in the investment business for 28 years, the last 15 of those as portfolio manager with Members Trust Company. And then on our um, call today from the Coastal Wealth Management Department is uh, myself, Drew Snyder. I'm the Director of Financial Planning. I'll be monitoring your chat questions. And at the end, I will be moderating the um, uh, question and answer with Sheldon with Wayne Johnson, who is another financial advisor here at Coastal Credit Union. And then also we have Evelina Caplap, our operations manager, who with Tiffany DeBose's help uh, is responsible for getting this webinar together, all the invites out and uh, basically the nuts and bolts behind it all. Coastal Wealth Management is uh, also part of CUSO Financial Services, who we partner with at the credit union to provide investment and insurance services for our members. So with that, I'm going to now turn over the webinar to Sheldon Reynolds and let him take it from here. Well, thank you, Drew. I uh, really appreciate the opportunity to speak to uh, Coastal members today about markets and the market volatility. And uh, so we'll go right on and, and jump into the meat of the presentation here. So as we've all seen, there's been a, a lot of market volatility uh, given the issues related to COVID-19 and how they have affected uh, kind of the economic activity of our nation and the world. The S&P 500, which is a widely used index of stocks, 500 of the biggest companies in America, was down as much as 35% uh, from its high recently. It's recovered a lot of that, but it, it did fall precipitously because of what all has been going on. Uh, the 10-year Treasury yield, which is the, the yield of U.S. Treasuries, at one point was as low as 0.318%. So when a yield is very, very low, that means there's high demand uh, that forces the yield down. And because people were kind of afraid of things, they were buying U.S. Treasuries and because they're seen as a, a safe haven and that forced the yield down to, to very low rates. Here again, that has recovered somewhat uh, since the bottom. But generally uh, speaking, there's been a broad-based selling of any liquid assets globally, and we'll talk a little bit about kind of exactly why that is in, in a couple slides. So here's a chart on the S&P 500. You'll notice that large drop there. Uh, since then, we've recovered a, a good half of that. So it's not as bad looking as it was here. Uh, the recovery's taken place over the last few weeks, but we had uh, kind of a steadily rising market over the last couple of years, except we did have some hiccups along the way. Like in 2018, you'll notice a pullback in the fourth quarter there. A lot of that had to do with concerns over potential trade war with China. The next chart shows the yield on that 10-year treasury that I mentioned. And as you can see, it's, it's kind of, if you look at it from a longer-term perspective from 2010, there's been a steady decline in that for a number of reasons, but uh, the spike down here on the very right-hand side of the chart had to do with the COVID-19 situation. Uh, here again, since then, it has come back a bit. 
uh, but that's a that's a chart on the United States 10-year Treasury. A little bit different perspective, we're going to look at 10-year Treasury yields as of a printing a few weeks ago. It's, it's slightly different than this now, but this chart's kind of an interesting one. It shows other uh, sovereign debt 10 year treasury equivalents. So, you know, the, the Bund would be the German equivalent of the US Treasury. Um, but you'll notice when you start looking at that line, the, the kind of the blue numbers where the arrow is pointing down, is that you'll see some very interesting things going on there. And if you look in Germany, you actually see negative interest rates. And you see the same thing in Sweden, Netherlands, Switzerland. Uh, so in, in Europe in general. And so we have briefly and very short periods of time experienced negative interest rates here, but it's kind of a new phenomena that really for people who are in the wealth management business and, and studied it uh, uh, even recently, the, the textbooks don't really say much about the possibility even of negative interest rates because it's kind of interesting that you would, if you were a German, give your money essentially to the, the German equivalent of the treasury and guarantee yourself to lose money <laughs> and then they give it back to you at maturity. Uh, there's a couple of reasons for that. One is Germany going into this uh, and, and really all of Europe had not recovered from the Great Recession kind of the way that we did. We, we've had a, a pretty good recovery out of it. The last few years have been quite nice as far as growth goes. They hadn't experienced that to the same extent in Europe, so they kept pushing uh, quantitative easing, which we'll talk about more, it, on their individual economies, uh, and they really wanted to keep rates low to stimulate economic growth, okay, because the thought is if you can borrow money at low rates, that will stimulate economic activity, uh, but it does create an interesting dynamic when you're looking at yields around the world. And, and I'll talk about this a little bit later in our forecast, but it creates kind of a cap on how high higher interest rates can go because of arbitrage situations that exist where you could essentially uh, buy U.S. Treasuries at X yield. Um, and, and so why wouldn't money flow there? So it creates this demand for the slightly higher yielding instrument from those institutions that have the ability to invest wherever they want globally. Uh, so interesting phenomena. Uh, so it's, it's actually even lower in other countries. So why did all this happen? Well, it was really due to the extreme measures uh, by governments, uh, foreign governments, U.S. governments, uh, states, as we've seen here, counties, as we've seen here, engaging in very extreme measures to fight the spread of COVID-19. They're doing what they think they need, they believe needs to be done to stop this, or at least reduce its impact. And you know, by essentially closing down large swaths of the economy, it had a very negative impact on economic activity, on stocks, et cetera, as you saw from, from that happening. So think about it this way. Imagine you're driving down the interstate and uh, you're cruising along at 70 miles an hour and suddenly you see something ahead of you that is, is very dangerous, very concerning, and you just literally stomp on the brakes and come screeching to a halt. I mean, that's sort of what happened to the economy here. And it's going to take a while to get things going again, uh, which would involve reopening up parts of our economy. So, so that's really kind of what's behind it all. It had very negative impact on economic activity, which I really don't have to explain to everybody. You've seen it, uh, hence the question about takeout foods. Uh, and, you know, a lot, all of our department stores are closed. Uh, anything considered not essential is. Um, and, and, and even, even some stores that have uh, the ability to stay open uh, have, have chosen not to due to very, very low demand. Uh, I've, I've personally noticed in, in my neck of the woods, uh, I'm kind of a coffee addict, and so I like I like my Starbucks. And uh, a couple of the Starbucks near me actually are closed, where where there's a couple that are a little bit further away that are open, at least at the drive-through window is. So it's had very negative impact. Even uh, restaurants that do have drive-through windows or have takeout, they've seen their sales plummet. Uh, 
So, so it has had very serious consequences. And because of this, uh, it's dri- it drove the markets to large-scale asset liquidations. In other words, people were panicking. They didn't really know naturally. They didn't know what was going to become of all this, how long we would be in this situation. And so uh, they sold assets. And they really also didn't know kind of what an appropriate value was for, say, stocks or a stock market or a bond because the future revenue streams have become very unclear. Uh, And they've become unclear because we don't know when things are going to open back up, how people are going to behave when they do open back up. As as kind of an anecdote, I did, I've been trying to stay on top of what's going on in Germany. So Germany has kind of slightly cracked the doors open. Uh, They they felt like they were a little further along in this than we were. And uh, so they have opened up stores up to a certain square footage, which escapes me at the moment. But what they're seeing, at least from the articles I've been reading, is that even though those stores are open again, they're not seeing people come in and rows to buy things. It's, it's a much lower percentage of what they would normally see on a normal day. So because of that kind of uncertainty on when various industries are going to open back up, and when people globally are going to start spending money again and and buying things, uh, that's really what the has, has driven this uncertainty. And, and, and whenever we have uncertainty, it creates a lot of volatility, et cetera. So that's a little bit about what drove all this. Now we're going to talk a little bit about recent action to address it. So first we'll talk about the federal reserve. I'm sure you've seen lots of TV shows and, and, and newspaper articles about all the different things that have been going on. I will try to review it briefly here. The first thing that happened really kind of at the very beginning of this was the uh, Federal Reserve cut the Fed funds rate unexpectedly uh, down to zero to 25 percent. Here again, trying to stimulate economic growth and to provide liquidity. They did that. And then very shortly thereafter, they did a number of other things that they can do. One is the expansion of a reverse repo operation in a very large way, $2 trillion, and we're talking T trillion. Uh, And that's to provide liquidity to financial institutions. Reverse repos and related instruments are used for kind of short-term funding back and forth between these institutions. Also, the QE kicked in in a very big way. You probably will remember this term, quantitative easing, from the financial crisis of 2008, 2009. That's really when we first became exposed to it. During that financial crisis, uh, there was very significant buying of treasuries and agency mortgage-backed securities uh, at that time to to help kind of provide liquidity and, and and serve as a backstop. For, the, for those instruments, uh, the recent round of QE by the Federal Reserve is bigger and it involves more assets, including municipal bonds and now higher quality corporate bonds uh, as well. So, so basically the Fed is buying up lots of these things to keep a demand for them and also to keep liquidity and to, and to serve as kind of the buyer of, of last resort and to take them off the books of banks who might want to use that liquidity to loan money. The difference this time is that they're saying that this is truly unlimited. They will buy whatever they need to buy. So they really pulled out the big bazooka, so to speak, and they're, they're blasting it with everything they can. In addition to that, they have created several facilities which provide liquidity, which are similar to the operations listed above. One is commercial paper funding, which is a short-term instrument that's used, think of as very, very short-term bonds. Then money market mutual fund liquidity to provide liquidity to that market, which is very important these days. And then term asset-backed securities, which would be other bonds which are backed by assets other than mortgages, could be various loans or actual hard assets. And then uh, also to provide a a primary corporate credit facility, which since then has been expanded. So the bottom line is when you look at that list, the Federal Reserve has done an awful lot to shore up our economy through all this action. And they're not the only central bank doing this. Uh, You're seeing it in other countries throughout the globe. 
Separately, the U.S. government has engaged in a number of uh, things that, to really kind of provide funding mostly for all kinds of things that they deem important. And this has been a, uh, even though it's sometimes been a little bit contentious, it has been a bipartisan effort, so it's, it's not really a partisan thing. So the first was the uh, state of emergency declared by the president, which immediately freed up $50 billion in aid to state and local governments, which they needed. Uh, also, they pushed out the federal income tax payments to help provide some relief to taxpayers. Then they had uh, the first of the three phases, as they call it, of legislation that was uh, went through Congress, the Senate, and then ultimately signed by the president. The first was $8.3 billion and primarily used to fund vaccine research and also to provide additional funding to state and local governments. In phase two, uh, which is much bigger, $100 billion, uh, was to fund free virus testing, to expand unemployment benefits, which is a, a big thing that we've all been hearing a, a lot about, and also to provide additional funding for Medicaid and SNAP, and SNAP is the uh, what used to be referred to as food stamps, and also to fund uh, sick leave pay for affected workers. And then phase three, which was $2 trillion, right, so that's considerably bigger than either of the two before, was how they funded these payments to individuals that are going out now, you know, the $1,200 checks that you're, you're hearing about, and also to provide essentially bailout money uh, for the in, for industries like airlines and others that have been hurt so badly uh, through loans and other assistance, and also the uh, small business loans to help provide uh, some relief for all the small businesses that have had to shut their doors or or you know, cut back significantly on, on their operations. And also uh, more money for hospitals and healthcare providers. Since this uh, slide was, was created, there's also additional things in the works. So you may be hearing talk of a phase four, depending on how quickly things start to recover. It seems like Congress and the Senate, as well as the Federal Reserve we saw on the other slide, are uh, really willing to do this in a very big way. So bottom line is there's a lot of things being done to address this uh, by U.S. government as well as uh, other, other governments throughout the world, really. So now a little bit about our outlook. Um, so we believe that there will be continued market volatility and mostly driven by the news cycle. So if we do see some setbacks where there is a renewed cases, hospitalizations, deaths, uh, particularly in some of the states that are recently opened up, then that could be a negative because uh, people will assume that this is going to drag out a lot longer than anticipated. So they will, uh, you might see some stocks react negatively to that. Uh, it could be the opposite. We could see things uh, move along better than expected. So we don't really know how this is going to go. Obviously, I don't think anybody does, but we believe there's going to be continued market volatility, um, both on the up and the downside, and we're probably going to have a, lo a lot of you know up and down days over the coming months. There is a recession coming. We, we believe we're already in it. It's very unclear how long and how deep this recession is going to be. Um, so what, what we have here is a lot of uh, economists, market prognosticators are hoping for what they call a V-shaped recession. So in other words, it would be a, a quick drop like we've seen in the, in the economy, uh, followed by a quick bottom out, and then it would you know, shoot back up. That would be best case scenario. So if we saw that, then, then that would be very good for economic conditions and, and likely the markets as well. Uh, however, uh, that's not clear that that's going to happen. So the recovery could take longer and it could uh, go in cycles. You know, you might have what they call a double dip recession where we come out of it and then other things happen and maybe the virus comes back and some of this stuff is implemented again and hopefully everybody's a little bit better prepared for it, but it could lead to, you know, further economic slowdown uh, or not. So we don't really know. So it's very unclear how long and how deep the recession is going to be. 
unemployment will and already has spiked. So uh, there has been a lot of layoffs. Uh, that's what all the stimulus and, and, and money was for, really was to, or a lot of it was to address that. Uh, and we believe that you'll see continued unemployment claims over the coming weeks. So we don't think we're at the, you know, kind of the, the top of that yet. Uh, so unemployment has already spiked and it will continue to spike. And that's not a good thing uh, because, uh, you know, you've got a lot of people out of work. Uh, they can't really contribute to the economy until they go back to work. It, however, uh, all this being said, when you stand back and you try to look at what has happened in you know other events uh, like the Great Recession of 2008-2009 and, and the plunge in the markets back then, like we saw in 1987, while all of them were the result of different things, the economy did recover and uh, the U.S. stock market has proven to be a good place to invest for long-term investors who are willing to take some risk. So that being said, we believe and are positive on the U.S. economy and on stocks in the long haul. We believe that we have been and are still at a situation that is, we believe is considered a long-term equity buying opportunity. We're not big on speculating, and so we don't want to try to make a quick buck uh, you can never pick the bottoms out, but generally speaking, and I'll show you in the next chart, kind of some things we've done over the last few years, we believe that if we buy on the dips, even really, really big dips, uh, that is pr a proven strategy to work over the long haul. We do believe, however, that low rates are likely to be with us for a very extended period of time due to all of the QE, due to actions by the Fed. And um, so, frankly, I, I don't think we're going to get really good rates on uh, things like, you know, CDs or money markets or, you know, frankly, even treasuries uh, for, for quite a while uh, until, until things really, really start to recover in a, in a bigger way. So that's kind of our outlook. Uh, I will share with you now kind of what we've been doing. So this chart that you see is our recent trading activity. So we, we have a, a discipline that we use uh, that we call opportunistic rebalancing. So essentially we, we manage a, a series of model portfolios that use exchange traded funds as the underlying investments. And we've been running them for over 12 years. But basically the discipline that we use is that when the markets go down, uh, we rebalance our accounts and we overweight stocks if we think it's a good buying opportunity. When, as markets rise, uh, especially when they get what we think are a little overvalued, then we will rebalance and either go back to neutral weighting uh, of stocks or, or a, even under weighting at times. So if you look at this chart, it goes back to uh, December of 2018. And as I mentioned before, in the, the first stock market chart that I showed, the fourth quarter was rather nasty that year. We all have kind of short memories and we kind of forget about that, but it was. And uh, it was primarily because the stock sold off because everybody was worried about a, a trade war with China. That was kind of the driving thing then. So we looked at it and we thought, you know, generally speaking, the economy looked pretty positive over the next couple of years. And so we were going to buy on the dips. And so we did. We rebalanced our accounts and we overweighted stocks at that point. Then you'll notice the next couple of trades uh, in early 2019 is as the markets did in fact recover, like, like we were hoping, uh, we took a little bit of profit off of stocks, first going to target weight and then going to underweight stocks because we felt like they were a little overvalued in the short haul. Uh, then the market in fact did dip and we bought back to target uh, in, in um, you know, late spring, early summer of 2019 and then the market popped back up rather quickly and we went back to underway so you see kind of the pattern there where we're we're, we're buying on the dips and we're selling on the run-ups because we believe that that adds value over time and it actually reduces risk a little bit by selling as markets are rising uh, then the market uh, continued to rise for the rest of the year and we actually did go to underweight equities again uh, 
back in uh, the, the end of the year. So going into this, we were actually underweight stocks. But you'll notice as the market started to go down, we did buy equities on four separate occasions as the markets continued to decline. We continued to feel that they were a good long-term investment. So we would buy them and, and average our average cost down a little bit uh, for each of the trades. Now that trade, as you notice, does not include what's happened over the last month. And over the last month, you have seen uh, that chart. If you saw you know, what happened after that, was the markets did in fact go up and make a, a good bit of that loss. So that worked out rather well for us. And then at that, uh, recently, the most recent trade we did is we actually did lighten up in stocks a little bit. Because here again, we don't think we're gonna go straight up. We think it's gonna be volatile. And if you believe that, then you continue to kind of sell a little bit as they rise and buy on the dips. And we continue to think about that. So that's a little bit about kind of what we've been doing in our standard model accounts. Uh, so now we're going to talk briefly about kind of where do we go from here. So we do believe that there's going to be some things different about a post-COVID-19 world than a pre-COVID-19 world. We saw this in 9-11, things did change, okay? Uh, a lot of aspects of, of the economy were, and, and the way we live were similar, but some things changed. Like if you travel through airports, you know a lot of things change. So we believe that because of the consequences and because of people's personal experiences with this, that you're likely gonna see some things change. And these are some things that we've thought about. There probably will be a lot more. Um, we think that US companies will rethink their supply chain. So early on, uh, we started to realize that we were very uh, dependent on one specific country for not just a lot of the stuff that we buy, but also some of the components of stuff that are even bought here. And so it disrupted our supply chain for a while. So we do think companies might bring back some more production to the US, or even if they're gonna keep production overseas because it's more cost effective, they likely will diversify into multiple countries uh, to fill the supply chain so they're not dependent on one specific country. So we think that that's likely to happen. We also think the pace of globalization will likely slow. So globalization is uh, proven to be a, a little bit of a two-edged sword. Um, we believe in general globalization has been a positive thing in that when countries are trading with each other, they tend not to go to war with each other. So if we can kind of interconnect our economies um, and trade with each other and do business in other countries and they do business here, uh, that's probably a pretty good thing in the long haul. However, uh, we've seen the downside to it, particularly the part about very uh, open travel and how quickly in given the kind of the jet age that we live in, how quickly a virus like this can spread globally. So probably going to see the pace of globalization slow down a bit. We also believe there will be less business travel. So like, like tonight, we're having this uh, presentation via uh, a webinar. Uh, in, in the past, we would have done it in person at the credit union. So uh, we're seeing a lot of this. I personally am on a lot more conference calls and a lot more uh, web meetings and, and doing a lot of webinars. Uh, so, so the way I'm working is becoming more, is becoming a little bit different. Uh, we believe there will be an increase in remote workers uh, and uh, increase in the investment to be able to have people work effectively remotely. So um, luckily for me, I, uh, I work for Members Trust Company for the last 15 years and uh, I do work remotely and I have for a very long time. So they set me up very nicely a long time ago to be able to do my job without being at headquarters. And, uh, and uh, over time, we've kind of expanded our footprint through a lot of remote workers. So I think a lot of other companies will do the same thing. Uh, th th it just makes a lot of sense as far as saving money uh, and, and providing kind of contingency plans like, like you see here. We also believe that consumer behaviors are likely to change. So Americans are notorious spenders. We, we can't help it. Uh, we love to spend money, but kind of the way that we spend money uh, and maybe even the amount that we spend might change going forward. One is 
the trend towards internet commerce, which we've seen grow rapidly over the last, gosh, at least decade, we think is going to continue to expand. Bricks and mortar retailers are going to continue to struggle. Uh, and and you know if those that survive through this, you may see them scale back operations, shrink store sizes, uh, focus on certain product lines that, that are the most profitable. So we think that in general, the internet commerce will continue to expand. Plus, a lot of people who weren't big users of internet commerce, now that they've been home for a couple of months and have been using it aggressively, are now comfortable with it. So we think that that will continue. We also think that Probably uh, there will be increased saving and a little, less, a little less spending overall. You know, um, Americans have been through kind of the second financial crisis in you know, roughly a decade. And so it's going to make a lot of people think that, hey, maybe something like this could happen 10 years from now, 20 years from now, 30 years from now. Maybe I need to have a little bit bigger emergency nest egg than I've ever had. You know, I read an article. I, I, I can't vouch for its correctness or not, but it did come from a major uh, periodical that said the average American has about $500 in savings, which is incredible to me. Uh, so we believe that, that in general, there probably will be a little bit more focus on saving for a rainy day and a little less spending going on. The other thing which it, it might happen, it might not, is over the last uh, really 20 years or so, you know, I've, I've watched it happen around here. I've lived in Raleigh for a long time. And I remember when I first moved here, uh, downtown Raleigh was dead, man. If you went down there on the weekends and, and downtown Durham was, was really the same way, uh, there was nothing going on. Now it's a totally different story. It's very vibrant apartment buildings everywhere, restaurants, uh, museums. It's, it's very active uh, city centers, and I've seen this really all over the country. You've seen this kind of rebirth of city centers. However, given this and given the fact that when people do live in very, very close proximity to one another, um, it does exacerbate the, the spread of, of a disease like this, people may rethink that, and you may see maybe a little bit more interest in people living in the suburbs or, or really even rural areas because as I mentioned before, the ability to work remotely kind of frees you up to be able to live in, you know, places that aren't downtown. Uh, that, you know, so that's some trends that we think that we will see. So <clears throat> this is kind of the end of my presentation. So now I'm going to turn it back over to Drew to kind of wrap us up and open it up for questions. Well, thank you so much, Sheldon, for spending the evening with us and, and sharing your and members' trust companies' views on the economy and the markets. So we do have a few questions that have come in. First, you know, just to get things started, Sheldon, I had a question for you. You mentioned that if rates stay low for an extended period of time, I'm curious, uh, what assets do you think uh, investors should be looking for to um, – uh, in, a, in a period like that when we have low interest rates? Great question. So I, I can tell you a little bit about what we do because so having uh, bonds or, or fixed income is very important to most investors and, and to the accounts that we run as a risk reduction tool. So unless you're really, really an aggressive investor, it, it's probably not appropriate for you to be in an all stock portfolio because the bonds are there to kind of cushion the blow, and we've seen that work rather well in, in the recent market. Uh, but it does it does beg the question of how much you're going to make on those bonds in the long haul. So we focus more on quality of bonds than we do yield. So we're not big proponents and never really have been of buying, say, a high-yield bond, even though the current income is higher, the risk is higher. And so our particular philosophy is that we will probably continue to buy treasuries and, and high quality corporates in these funds that we use, but we will trade them. And so as an example, one of the things that we do is that we look at yield spreads. So we look at the difference in yields between, say, mortgage backs and treasuries and high quality corporates. And when we're rewarded for higher yield, like if we see a pop in rates on corporates, we might reallocate some of our fixed incomes to corporates. 
Uh, and then if corporates rally, which means their yield would fall, we might unwind that and go back. So, so there's some trading activities that could still be done even with low interest rates. Um, so low interest rates bring about a lot of questions and, and a lot of implications too. One is if, if rates stay low, if you have the ability and you have some goals in life that require borrowing money, uh, probably not a bad time to do it, right? Because you know, net net, you would work out, you know, better uh, by 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 borrowing money at, at lower interest rates. Um, if you're somebody that that really is not wild about low yield bonds, things like that, which we might see, then there are, are alternatives and. Some of them I am not an expert on, you know, things like various annuity products. And that would be you know, something more for you to meet with a financial advisor about and, and talk with them about whether that might be a good alternative. Um, stocks do have a decent yield on them, you know, roughly 2%. Uh, so um, they're also an alternative as long as you are very careful about what you, you buy. Uh, so that's a little bit about you know, what we're going to do in, in the fixed income area in the low interest rate environment. All right. So thank you for that. So the next question I would, um, is from our, one of our listeners, um, what sectors do you see rebounding faster and which sectors do you see rebounding slower coming out of the, um, the recession? And that's a good question too. So one of the issues that I think people need to be careful about right now is, is is sector investing okay um, so what we do as as a money manager is we don't try to pick specific sectors so in other words we don't like buy tech funds or we don't buy utility funds we buy by the s p 500 we buy broader based assets but i can tell you this in general the things that are related to consumer um, you know, uh, products, you know, like you saw the the surge in f people buying food, paper products, things like that, obviously cleaning supplies have helped them a little bit compared to other stocks. Also, some of the big tech companies have done better than other things. Obviously, those things that are transportation related or particularly travel related, like airlines, cruise ships, hotel, I mean, they've really gotten hurt really, really bad. So uh, probably if, if I were going to go with sectors right now, uh, I would uh, probably go more conservative personally and, and focus more on things like, uh, uh, you know, high quality consumer products, perhaps even utilities, and then maybe even uh, large tech. But honestly, large tech may be getting a bit overvalued as well as consumer products. So that's my worry is that a lot of times we as investors tend to chase the things that did best over the last month or two, and, and maybe it's too late to chase them, and maybe we should be looking more at things that are already beaten up. The, the downside to buying things that are already beaten up that worries me is, is what happens. So like with the airlines, you know, I think there is, even with the bailouts and all, you still could have a situation where they end up going bankrupt. And so if you're a shareholder, if you own equity in them, uh, you may in fact lose your entire investment in them. So I have been recommending that people err more on the more conservative things if they're going to go in and buy sectors or even individual stocks. Okay, thanks. So now we have two questions that are kind of related to retirement. Um, so I'm going to put those to you and then maybe I could follow up with my perspective on that too. Um, what impact do you believe the economic challenge will have on someone looking to retire in the next five years? So I think, I think as long as you've got a good plan in place, if as long as you have, have sit down and crunched the numbers or had, had a financial advisor work with you on that. And I think, you know, that, and then you've got, an opportunity actually that if you are somebody that's got some cash sitting on the sidelines uh, potentially as I mentioned uh, you know we think equities are you know not a bad buy here if you've got a long-term time horizon you got to remember if you retire five years from now it's not like you're gonna just cash out of everything in five years that money is gonna work for you for a very long time so while 
at first blush, your time horizon might only be five years. It may be 40 years, you know. So having some equity <clears throat> component to your overall portfolio over that long period of time may be advantageous to you. Um, what, what I am more worried about is those people who just retired. Okay, if if you say just retired and you've started pulling money out of of your investments and you take this kind of hit, hopefully you you went into this not being too conserv uh, too too aggressive, and you can weather the storm okay. So um, so that that's my general feeling is I think it's more important to make sure that your plan is appropriate and realistic, and that you and this is where you know Coastal can help you through their financial planning services. Yeah, so I was I was going to piggyback on that, that um, give a little commercial for our, our financial planning and uh, retirement planning service here at Coastal. Certainly, the the number one thing you should be doing is having a plan in place. And and if uh, if you want us to help you with that, of course, we are welcome to. We're open. We're doing lots of meetings with our members over the phone, even though our branches are closed. <laughs> Uh, so we have, you'll have the opportunity to to sit down and talk to one of our advisors who can help you put in that short-term plan. We kind of recommend that, depending on your risk tolerance, that you might want to have two or three years of cash set aside as you're entering retirement. So you can weather a, a situation like we're in right now that, let's face it, no one is really looking forward to uh, or, or, or predicting would happen. And then, as Sheldon said, we're going to make sure that you also have uh, your investments appropriately invested for the long term, because um, you know most people are counting on living a good 25, 30 years in their retirement, and you need that growth for your investments to last. Anything to add to that, Sheldon? No, I think you summarized it really well. Okay. Someone asked what the cost is. We have a, our, our retirement planning program here at Coastal is no cost to our members. So all you have to do is schedule a meeting with one of our advisors. We go through the financial planning process, which means we'll send you out a, a data gathering tool for you to, to complete. It's a PDF fillable, then you can just send it back to us. The advisor will have that for your first meeting and uh, review your goals, your, uh, your investments, what you've done so far, basically to get ready for, um, for your retirement. And then we'll put together your financial plan. That's basically my job here at Coastal as the director of financial planning. I do most of our financial planning work. Um, I work with our eight financial advisors to get that done for our members. And, uh, and then your advisor is going to sit down and go over the results and, and put a plan of action in place. So I'm just going to close it out and say thank you to Sheldon for, for being here this evening and and um, giving us his presentation. And I want to thank all the members who joined us too. And we will be doing more of these webinars in the future. Uh, one in particular that we're getting ready to set up right now is on long-term care insurance. Um, and I'll be doing a retirement seminar in May. So keep an eye out for those in your inbox and visit our website and look there also for our webinars. I want to thank everyone and have a great evening tonight. Enjoy your dinner.